I've heard from a lot of people that they liked my talks five years ago. How many people saw my talk five years ago? This has nothing to do with my talk from five years ago. <laughs> uh, uh, and I have given talks that have bombed, so I appreciate the fact that people liked the talk from five years ago. No guarantees about this talk. Um, uh, 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 I was very flattered that these guys have been hassling me for five years pretty much to come back to Bruce Khan, and, and I haven't been here, not because I didn't enjoy it tonight, the company has just always been a scheduling conflict that's come up in May. And so this year I was available and it was nice. I actually got to come and enjoy the conference where last time I kind of flew in and gave my keynote to the lab. And it's been a lot of fun, fun uh, uh, chatting with all you guys and, uh, and getting to know you and attending all the sessions. It's a really great conference. So hopefully I'll keep coming back here. Um, uh, I wanted to take a little bit of a, a counter position in my keynote here, uh, largely because I drew the slot for the last keynote. So I thought if I came here and gave a keynote about all the wonderful things about uh, C++ 11, going with the theme of the conference, uh, that I'd be overlapping everybody. Uh, so, so I decided not to overlap anybody <laughs> and go a little bit different direction. So, so it's now what? So I'm going to start looking forward to where the language needs to go. And in my opinion, it needs to go pretty quickly here. Um, I broke my thought, my, my uh, talk, into three parts. And the first part is beauty. So the current C++ standard, 11, 1,338 pages. What's that? Yeah, that's the page count number on the last page that shows a page count number. I thought that, that was a fair way to do it. So. <laughs> What's that? That big thing in the back is what? Index? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, C 98 standard, 757 pages. I didn't quite double it. Uh, Nearly every addition to the language is intended to make the language uh, easier for developers for a beautiful code. So does it does it does it succeed? Um, well, one way I measure that is by looking at STL. Because at STL, I had the pleasure of working with Alex Stepanoff for, for a number of years. And his intention was that STL was kind of an example of beautiful code. So this is STD pair, uh, not to pick on, on our friend over here who wrote this. This is STD pair. This is all STD pair in the standard library. This is a pair of two objects. I don't know that and all. 
line instead of the first and the last, and also interacts with tuple and, and handles all that well to do it efficiently without recreating everything that's in pair and then adding all the arithmetic operators. And even with all this complexity, easy things that I wanted to do for years, like just write, I have a pair of integers, I still can't do with STD pair. So, although luckily now I can actually define my own, although if I do that, I'm going to get a ton of ambiguity errors. So I'm going to have to qualify things in my own, own space or give my pair a different name than STD pair. Okay. So, how big of a problem is this? So this was literally, I was literally working on this talk. I was at about this point in this talk in my office, in my phone rings, and I pick it up. I don't hear hello. I don't hear, you know, hey, Sean. This is what I hear. We're getting an error that has something to do with our value references and STD pair. The first thing that's popped into my head is, is the eagle is in his nest. <laughs> I didn't know how to respond to this. Right? Is this a question? <laughs>
reason is, Google didn't used to be part of the language. And Photoshop is a 20 year old focus. Okay, not all of these are directly out of Photoshop. Some of them are part of the third party libraries. Um, and some of them are, are libraries from different parts of the company. So I'm glad that not many people knew why you were counting people. Because the response when I said, I said, well, Photoshop predates Google. And the response from the engineer on the other side was, oh my god, you're older than Dits. <laughs> This has been working for 20 something years, and I don't even object to an upgrade to my libraries breaking my 20 year old code. In fact, anybody who knows me, I'm always like, break me off it, right? right? Force me to write my code better. What I care about is that the error message that came out of this, <laughs> two senior engineers looking at it couldn't figure out what in the world was going wrong. That's the problem. The breakage. Isn't the problem. Okay. I'm curious, was the error message longer or shorter than the implementation of pair? Yeah. <laughs> it is actually shorter. I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> yes, it is actually shorter. So I wanted to end this section on the upbeat note, so I was looking for some beautiful code to insert here. And I couldn't come up with anything that was really representational. If you come to my talk tomorrow, I do have some nice code there that you can look at. But we've seen a lot of beautiful code here. So I thought, OK, I don't want to be completely down on, on C++11. You can write beautiful code with C++11. And you've seen lots of beautiful code when you've been here. So pause for a moment and imagine some beautiful code that you've seen in the comments on this slide. Uh, picture yourself up for a moment. <laughs> It's going to get worse. Because it's going to get worse. <laughs> so, what well, we lack in beauty, we gain in efficiency, though, right? I mean, a lot of the reasons for the complexity in STD pair is to handle all the edge cases and to make sure that it's wonderfully efficient. Maybe. <laughs> Section two truth. Um, I'm going to flip here to a little demo. Photoshop guys, because Photoshop 
open this image. Because <laughs> Photoshop has a, a legacy 32,000 pixel limit on the dimensions of JPEGs that it can open in their JPEG decoder. Uh, that will be fixed in the next version of Photoshop. Because Photoshop doesn't like to be embarrassed, especially for people who used to work on the um, uh, So, to give you an idea here, we're going to zoom in on this image. This is all on an iPad. Uh, this I actually did a slightly uh, custom build of it. Normally we only let you zoom at uh, to a scale of 2 to 1. Uh, this build lets you scale to 10 to 1. Uh, the reason for that is the, the iPad 3 display here is way higher resolution than what you're seeing up here, so you wouldn't be able to see all the pixels if I, if I had a camera 2 to 1. So you can see, we can see what time of day uh, uh, that panorama uh, was taken. Okay. Um, uh, uh, we could also do something uh, uh, like, let's, before we do that, let's uh, take a look on this image where we add a vignette to it. Uh, now this is the same image processing pipeline that's used in Photoshop Lightroom. And in the Camera Raw plugin, uh, which is also used in Bridge if you're, if you use Photoshop. Um, uh, so this is all done uh, uh, very high fidelity, 16-bit you know, all the way through the image processing pipe. Right? So we just applied a vignette there. Now we could come over here and say rotate 780 megapixels. Okay. Um, uh, and we can still come back here and zoom in uh, and around, let's zoom in on something else maybe. Okay. So, well, that's kind of blurry, it's actually a sharper here. Let's find something else to look at. It's sharp. Yeah, I know there's like a uh, So, so this image is actually something more realistic. So here we're opening it at our open time, about two seconds. Um, uh, I actually want to get rid of that. The president has this. I think we can do it instantly on this image. Uh, 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 this image is, is a more reasonable case. This is straight off a Leica S2 uh, camera. So this is a 37 and a half megapixel image. Um, uh, this is the beautiful image. Uh, uh, Tom Hodery took this. He's the one that I have on the team. It's his daughter. Um, uh, uh, so you don't really have to edit it to make this photo better. Um, uh, but you can see here, we're just pretty much dead smooth. And if you zoom in, <laughs> the hair and the chin, you're seeing pixelation there because we are blowing up about 10 to 1. Uh, but the texture and the fabric, um, you know, you can see she's been crying. Her nose there, the tears in her eyes, uh, her little scar on her nose. Okay, so um, uh, uh, it 
if you're a user of Lightroom, the Lightroom guys right now in front of the shop guys kind of hate me because I'm putting them to shame. We're much faster on a much less capable device than they are on desktop machines. Um, so let's go back to the slides. Uh, I, I'll, yeah, no, I'll tell you how I did it. So, uh, 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 Lightroom and Camera Raw, like Photoshop, um, Thomas Newell actually wrote Adobe Camera Raw, who also wrote Photoshop, so there's no coincidence here, uh, uh, has the same pyramidal data structure uh, for, for building up the, the image. So this is all tile pyramidal. Um, uh, I took their image processing pipe and uh, split it so so we're doing half of the image processing pipe on the CPU and then we're doing some of the post processing on the GPU uh, and then uh, uh, we're playing a lot of uh, uh, games on the on the GPU where uh, you can see it much more in the super high resolution image where you would see blurry edges and stuff coming in there so we have this fairly sophisticated two-layer display system. So it's always uh, keeping a low-resolution version of the entire image in the background, and then keeping a high-resolution version of what you're looking at in the foreground running that through the pipe. And those layers all exist on the GPU, so the rotation and stuff appears to be seamless. And we just update the foreground layer as rapidly as we can and keep that going. So there's a lot of data structures and algorithms there, which is how we pull off the performance. Um, uh, uh, so my answer from five years ago, not completely wrong. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about where the gigaflops are in a modern machine. So I'm giving credit here to Russell Williams, who's one of the architects on Photoshop. Uh, these are actually his slides that he did out. Uh, so a desktop computer, uh, this is not a super high machine, but not, no slouch, 8 cores, and a half gigahertz integrated machine, with about a $200 Canadian graphics card. Uh, those are the Google flops that are sitting in the GPU. Okay. Uh, if you're not writing vectorized code, well, that's how much performance you have, the giga flops in the vectorization unit on your computer. Uh, multiple cores is that little slice down there. Okay. If you're writing just single-threaded scalar code in straight C++, you're that little red line at the end. That red line is 0.25% of the giga flops in the machine. Okay. Thirteen years ago, when C++, the last C++ 98 standards came out, this graph looked completely different. Okay. That red line would have dominated. Okay. So, in my opinion, it's an embarrassment that C++ 11 came out, and C++ 11 doesn't let me get to the rest of this machine. So, now, with, with C++11, I can move up into the multi-threaded, right? We finally have a memory model. We've got threading support, so I can move up there. But really, the primitives that we have in C++11 aren't going to get you scaling much past four cores. Okay? I think you're going to have a hard time, you know, without doing a lot of work, taking what's in, in the current C++11 and getting performance up to a full eight cores. So, so you know, four cores gets you 1% of the machine. Um, so, so not, not too horrible. <laughs> now there's two different kinds of parallelism. And of course, C++ is tend mostly concerned over here with functional parallelism. And then there's data parallelism. And traditionally, we tend to think about it as kind of CPU and GPU. Uh, but this is changing incredibly rapidly, right? With vectorization units, we are doing much more data parallelism on the CPU, and 
done with GPGPU support, we're doing more functional programming on the GPUs. So it's no longer the case that there is this strict bifurcated model going on. Now, you can get to the vectorization unit if you want to from C++, uh, uh, but you're going to be doing it probably with intrinsics. So the top line there is a call, that's what the SSE intrinsics look like in uh, uh, both Clang and GCC if you're trying to to make use of your vectorization unit. Uh, wonderful thing to do, and the neon intrinsics look completely different. And for the iPad, neon is the vectorization unit that's in the ARM chips. So to get this thing blazing pretty fast, we had to take the SSE code and get that running on a neon with a completely different set of intrinsics. Um, and a vectorization is a moving target. Intel is about to move to AVX, which is a vectorization technology that's uh, 256 bit registers. Uh, there are some solutions for doing auto vectorization out there, uh, like Intel's auto, auto vectorization uh, 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 compiler. Does pretty good. Um, you're still going to do better hand tuning. So there is no, you know, nothing is in the standard support in this area. <coughs> For data parallel code, right now, the reality is you get about 300 to 1 performance on the GPU versus the CPU. Uh, sequential code will still be better on the CPU, uh, but that gap is tightened up incredibly quickly. And at a 10 to 1 gap, uh, uh, it starts to make sense to push more of your sequential processing into your data parallel pipe. Okay. The typical object oriented paradigm that people tend to think about really breaks down in a massively parallel environment with shared pointers uh, 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 to objects because sharing implies you're either running single threaded or you're, you're, you're synchronizing. Okay. What's that? Or not mutating. Or not mutating. Not mutating is fine. Const share pointers are then no problem. Okay. Uh, how many people know what Amdahl's law is? Good, everybody. I could have put the formula up here. I like, I did this graph for slides a while ago. I like this graph uh, of Amdahl's law. Uh, so we've got performance going up, up the left, processors across the bottom. Uh, the red line is perfectly scaling, okay? And each of the lines coming down to there is 10% is synchronization going on. Okay, so you can see with just 10% of your app synchronized, your performance curve falls way, way off. So new text is bad. Um, uh, the other thing that this graph tells you, if you and those laws applicable in more, more than one area, is that if you're focusing on optimizing for a piece of code, it's just a particular percentage of the code, and it's, it's, it's the processors, uh, uh, how much of a performance gain that you can get? Yes, the same as synchronization and synchronization. And even atomics have some level of synchronization. Okay? So, so what you want to do is try to get everything fanned out, up, fanned out as much as you can, and everything running in parallel, and absolutely minimize the amount of synchronization you have. You know, atomics are way better than New Texas, but atomics also have a huge cost. Writing to memory, memory is a shared resources. Writing and reading to memory has a cost and it produces some amount of synchronization. Right? If you're not paying attention to how much you're touching caches, you'll come down to about this line right there. No mutex is no anything else. Okay. So this is why writing scalable code is hard. Now the app I showed you, my, my embarrassment is that I'm only able to light up about half of the iPad. Okay? So that's the performance I'm getting 
lighting up half the iPad. I've got the vectorization unit pretty much saturated. I've got the two cores on this machine on the iPad saturated. Uh, uh, and I've got maybe a third, a little more of a third from the GPU saturated. I'm trying to live inside of OpenGL ES2 and no OpenCL. Um, uh, so, so it's a very limited environment trying to be processing up there. Okay, so if 1% of our application is uh, 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 kind of just straight C++ from a performance standpoint, then somewhere below the blue line down there is the amount of performance gain that we can get by optimizing that. Okay. So this ties us back to STD pair. Right? STD pair is very complicated because we are trying to optimize for a bunch of cases. And what we're trying to do is move somewhere between the black and the blue line at the bottom. People feel free to interrupt me. Everybody's in the You had mentioned earlier about the main processors getting more vectorization too, so obviously C++ needs to evolve towards vectorization. That is a very good point, yes. So I would love to have a standard way to deal with vectorization. Okay, so utilize the hardware, um, you need to move towards you know, more functional, declarative, reactive, how many people know what reactive programming is? So, you know, spreadsheets are the canonical example of reactive programming. The property model library that I presented five years ago here is a form of reactive programming. Um, uh, there's an interesting technology, something called Flapjack. So if you look it up, it's kind of a JavaScript library, uh, a reactive programming JavaScript library. And the app that I was just showing you uh, uh, is largely written in Lua, uh, uh, Adobe Rebel. And we have a port of the Flatjacks library running in Lua to give us a reactive model inside of Lua. So, so why does reactivity help with the use of hardware? Uh, reactivity helps with the use of the hardware in the same way that functional programming uh, helps 
with the use of the hardware in that it's you know, reactive programming is a form of functional programming in that it's a, it's a, it's a way to program uh, that gives you not thinking about locks and synchronizations and you can do things kind of massively parallel. You have your full dependency tree uh, 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 explicitly represented. So, uh, uh, no raw loops. This is, you know, people ask me, like, how do they improve the programming? Uh, one of my canonical answers is no raw loops. Don't stick a loop in the middle of your function, okay, unless that function is explicitly an algorithm. Uh, this is both from a code cleanliness standpoint, a code readability standpoint. It's also when you're trying to, to make things run fast and parallelize them, then you can start to say, okay, here are my algorithms, can I parallelize this algorithm? Uh, can I move this off to the GPU? How do I factor this out? So that's one of my own rules when you're writing code. Right? You know, a lot of people have their programming rules. That's my number one. No wrong loops in the code. So without addressing vectorization, GPU, GPU, and scalable parallelism, standard C++ becomes just a scripting system to get to the other 99% of the machine. Okay? It's a good scripting system for getting to the other 99% of the machine. Uh, uh, but we're doing it through other languages and other libraries, right? We're back-ending into OpenGL, OpenCL. Um, we're using Objective-C++. We're using Manage-C++ on Windows. Uh, uh, we're using you know, Intel TDB and other threading libraries. Uh, uh, so C++ itself, just as, as far as a standard language concerned, you don't get a lot of use out of it. So do we need such a complex scripting, scripting system? Okay, like I said, we, we're doing a lot in Lua. With this, it's a key advantage. It's, you know, I have lots of complaints about the Lua language. It's just not a, how great Lua language is, but it's a very simple language. So let's talk a little bit about goodness. <clears throat> Content ubiquity. Uh, how many people here are writing software in the consumer space? It's not as many as I would have thought. So, a few. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, this is my statement on where I think the consumer industry is going. Very rapidly. The idea is ubiquitous access to your stuff. Uh, people expect this through for the calendar, the contacts, the email, right? We all have these devices we're carrying around. We've got our iPads, our desktop. We tend not to think, you know, we should be able to get to our email from any computer to sit down at. Uh, but very rapidly, that's moved to, to uh, uh, you know, your music, your movies, your photos, your documents, your Google Docs. Everything. <coughs> the content ubiquity is access to all your information on all, all of your devices all of the time. Uh, what I didn't demo with REPL is that that's our big play with REPL. You take a picture on your phone, that picture is immediately available on your iPad, on your desktop. When I edit that 780 megapixel image, the edits are immediately available on my phone, um, uh, 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 on my desktop. Everywhere. Okay. So. Ubiquity has gone mainstream, and this has happened very rapidly. A typical US household now has three TVs, two PCs, one part, one smartphone. One of three households already has an internet connected TV. Okay. A typical US worker also has access to a PC at work. There's a deluge of digital information become a challenge to manage. Okay? This is what people struggle with. How do they get their information around? And people have just very rapidly come to expect that it's just going to work. The technology to put this all together, right? You know, five years ago you could have talked about, right, is the technology in place? Well, it is. 95% um, uh, of the user population is greater than three megabits broadband available to them, and 85% uh, uh, 
have greater than three megabits per second mobile broadband available to them. This doesn't mean they subscribe. It means they could if they wanted to. The U.S. ranks 28th in broadband subscriptions, so this is not just a U.S. phenomenon, this is an international phenomenon. Every other tier one market is ahead of the U.S., France is number 12, Germany is number 19, the UK is number 21, and Japan is number 27 for broadband adoption. Okay. Your data set is not too large to make ubiquitous data. I'm showing 780 megapixel images. Google puts me to shame with Google Earth. Your application is not too interactive. How many people know what OnLive is? A couple people. Uh, check it out. OnLive is like Netflix for video games. So literally streaming video games to your computer. They'll also sell you a little $100 box to plug into your TV. And you can play first-person shooters running around uh, all streaming. And it's quite a mess. OnLive also has a product called OnLive uh, desktop uh, that lets you get to a Windows desktop from your iPad. Quite well too. It will even play flash videos. Play flash videos in there. Okay. Uh, current hardware is more than capable enough. What's in a, a typical tablet these days? Those are specs from a, from an iPad 2. Uh, uh, except for the memory, double the memory, and you might have three there. Uh, so you've got two, two one gigahertz cores, a half to a gig of memory, fairly fast SSD sitting down there to be pulling bits on and off of. Uh, GPU, and I've had two is a two core GPU, and I've had three is a four core GPU. You've got a two level networking. Uh, we run the entire desktop pipe on the iPad 1 quite well. That has half the capability. So it's there. Now everybody seems to know that the cloud is the place to be here. Uh, we've got Apple with their iCloud, uh, that Adobe's new creative cloud. Uh, uh, Google just announced Google Drive. Uh, Amazon has their drive solution. Microsoft has SkyDrive. Uh, Dropbox. One of the smaller players in the space has their solution. So how many people here have at least one of these on there? Yeah, good to everybody. Okay. Um, uh, longer term, uh, I don't think the cloud direct play is going to be the play. I think the cloud needs to just disappear into the infrastructure. Right? right? You don't want to have to manage where your documents are and when they synchronize, you just want them there. So. Focus on content ubiquity, all your content instantly on any device, zero management overhead. Users don't want to care about the cloud, they want the content. So it's not a feature that you can easily bolt onto an app if you really want a seamless experience if you're dealing with, with data of any size. And you have to rethink your application architecture. So once you achieve the form of content ubiquity for one customer, you're really close to having a sharing collaboration model. And that's one of the features of Adobe Revel 2. I can share my collection in a writable way uh, uh, with anybody else. And most people can add photos to my libraries. They can edit photos in my library. Okay. So, it opens the door to sharing and collaboration. It also helps with the sandboxing problem right now and security. So it's not, you know, one problem with sandboxing on these devices is how do you get big data from application to application? Okay. Well, if you can share ubiquitously with your app through the cloud to all your devices, you can also share it to your companies and other applications on the device. Okay, so I encourage people, the people here who are working in the consumer space, to put yourself in the customer's shoes when you're thinking about your product. Okay. Assume anything is possible because in my opinion, it's like, wow, there's just so much technology left there it is, and just sit down and go build it. Okay. 
and then you're going to hit a wall, and it's going to hurt. So here's the developer pain. The market is incredibly fragmented right now. You've got Windows still dominating the desktop. OS X has getting close to 30% market share, depending on you, who you believe. You have iOS splitting the mobile space with Android. Uh, uh, if you're running your stuff in the cloud, uh, you're going to need to be on Linux. Uh, uh, you've got browsers and how, how you reflect yourself out to browsers. And if you want to deal in the television space, now you get Roku and a whole long list of, of different technologies for dealing in that space. And we got Windows RT. How many people know what Windows RT is? Windows Metro? Yeah, so uh, that's as different from the rest of Windows as iOS is to Mac OS, uh, uh, yet another platform. Okay? None of these markets, if you're in the consumer space, is too small to ignore. Okay. So it used to be you Mac and Windows, you could ignore everything else. Okay. Now you can't. So, horribly straight sentence up there. Uh, so you're required to write to all these different platforms and all these different technologies. A lot of the vendors are focusing on proprietary solutions. So Apple came out with OpenCL to get to the GPU. Uh, uh, they're trying to make a standard. Uh, NVIDIA has always been this company. Not too hot on, on OpenCL, so their support is not great for it. Uh, Microsoft has said there will be no OpenCL on WinRT. Okay, they're going to go with their own stuff. Could you quit comparing a Kubernetes echo sequence that the ISO C++ standard isn't covering today many of the things we can not do? Let me give you an example. Working with JSON data or XML is something that the standard is not going to it. So I think that this is a motivation for other vendors to start building on their own new stuff. It's in the case of Objective C class or even those managed extensions for, for C class. We don't have a common technology in C class for invoking components in other programming languages. So that's the reason why other vendors are going wrong, you know, and it yeah. could be maybe a chicken egg, right? I'm not sure after the month. It is, it, 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 in my opinion, you know, the, the, the number one reason that the vendors don't cooperate is that the vendors right now are playing a lock-in game, okay? So they, in my opinion, incorrectly believe that their proprietary technology is providing them a market advantage, okay? May, may I put an are those, you know, Objective C++ or Managed C++ are proprietary extensions? My understanding was that they are standards. I mean, you can implement yours based on what I can say about C++ and iPhone. Right, right, right. I'm not saying that, you know, like I said, the, the same is with, true with OpenCL, right? Right. So some of the companies are like, here's my technology, let me build it. You know, I don't want to build some of the companies are like, here's my technology, let's make that the standard. Some of them are like, no, 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 it's just mine. I mean, CUDA is a case of, you know, NVIDIA is just like, no, it's just CUDA, it's just ours. Okay? Um, uh, so some of them are, are like, hey, I own this, let's put it out. But those same companies are not being cooperative, they're not being reciprocal in that response. So if you have two companies going, here's my thing, you please adopt it, but I'm not, I'm not paying attention to what you're doing, that doesn't help. Okay? So you need cooperation amongst the vendors, right? And the reason why they don't cooperate is because, incorrectly, they consider their solution to be their advantage. Right? But the reality is, I can't ignore those other markets. And neither can any other significant application vendor, including Microsoft. Right? I mean, Microsoft has Office for Mac. There's rumors that Microsoft has, op has Office coming out for iPad. Okay, so nobody in this space can ignore the other player because the market's too big. Okay, so what you're forcing us to do is to all write to, to a slew of different technologies over and over and over and over and over 
And that does nothing but slow us down. And in fact, that actually damages, for anybody here who's at you know, Microsoft or Apple or Google, uh, uh, that actually damages your position. Because if I have to burn all of my resources to get to your platform, it's going to be at least a common denominator approach. Okay? So if it was easy to get to your platform, I could spend those resources really sh making your platform shine and utilizing what is your competitive advantage. C plugins also has to, has to kill innovation because it's, because it's going to be impossible for small vendors to you have the resources to cover all the platforms. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got a number of friends who have said, said, you know, I get this. I'm only going to write for iOS. Okay? And that's great. And and I can watch. It's like, yeah, that's great. Until you're successful. And as soon as you have a successful product, well, there's a whole pile of cash over there, okay? <laughs> and you will, you know, if you're a responsible person running the company, you will go after that, okay? So one at a time, I watch these, you know, exclusive to Android, exclusive to iOS, exclusive to whatever, go, well, yeah, we're not exclusive anymore, we're jumping over over there, okay? And it's painful. Okay. So now what? Uh, originally I had the C++ 20x. Uh, I'm going with C++ next because I think 20x is too long. Um, uh, already the amount of standardized C++ code that I can write is dwindling rapidly. Okay. Uh, I think we really need to focus on simplicity in the next version of the language. So I think it would really be an embarrassment if the next version of the language, if STD pair, wasn't a nice, small, tight little class that had all the efficiencies that we put into it. Marshall? Um, yeah, the, the second bullet point you got there, the standardized access to modern hardware, yep. um, that just, you know, that I, I hear in my head, I hear skating where the puck is as, the board, as opposed to where the puck is. <laughs> yes. I mean, part of that is, is making sure that you're talking with the hardware vendors. Um, uh, the trend right now seems to be pretty clear. I think we're going to stay in, for at least a while in a somewhat heterogeneous environment. Uh, what's happening is that those GPU cores are moving uh, closer to the CPU and we're getting to much more shared memory architectures in the space. So that, I think, is going to be, is going to be the trend. Um, but I also think in going this direction, uh, the C++ standard is going to have to push on, on you know, what you can do with the GPUs and what, uh, uh, you know, how you would go about doing that. And I don't think that's too big of a problem because I think the, the hardware manufacturers are, are at least somewhat interested in this space. Right, right. They're going there as well, even if they're going the proprietary route. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying that you know, looking at what, where things are today and trying to plan for a few years from now is, you know, you want to think, think more about where things are going to be in two or three years. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So my uh, my depressing punchline to this talk, <laughs> you know, is that is that we've got this, this language uh, uh, of which only gets to me only gets me to one percent of the performance of my machine. And so then I'm tied to proprietary backends to get to the 99% of the machine. And that wouldn't be that bad if I didn't have to get to that 99% of the machine in different ways. Okay, which means that even the code that I'm writing to get to that the rest of the, the machine isn't portable. Okay. So, yeah. so have you thought about? I'm sure you thought about it. Is there a level of expression above, you know, a, a level of abstraction at which one could program that would allow a portability layer to to erase all of that platform? I think there is, and I think there are lots of them out there right now. I mean, OpenCL is one. Um, uh, C++ 
plus AMP is looking very promising as another. Uh, uh, even, uh, uh, I was talking with Michael, uh, OpenMP is looking at taking <coughs> ideas from OpenMP and applying them uh, uh, to both vectorization and GPU processing. Um, uh, so yes, I think there are, there are many models and some of them are fairly well vetted uh, uh, out there to do this. So, could you do it in the library interface? Could you do it in the library interface? Possibly. Possibly. Um, uh, well, I don't know. I think it would be really hard to like, well, so maybe, but, you know, it, it would be tough. Like maybe with something like Lambdas where, I, you know, or you know, function objects where I could hand off the kernel. But I would need a fairly sophisticated back end on that, something that could vectorize a kernel. Okay. So there is Intel, I think they called it CT, which goes along that direction. Where yes. they try to collect the expressions from C and have that hand that over to a specialized engine. Yes. Java, which is 
the language itself, the compiler, maybe their expressions, maybe some UI technologies, etc. And what they call the enterprise edition, that is database access, and maybe distributed components, etc. So they have different focus groups, and uh, maybe like a sort of advisory board where every proposal for standard is approved, or maybe debate or defense, etc. I, I, think, I think that it works exactly that <coughs> way yeah. already. So now it has been working that way. Yeah. C++ so far, correct me if I'm wrong, was mostly the standard edition of Java, I mean, in terms of equivalence. It was just things like regular expression, etc. But nothing going beyond, you know, like for instance, GPU access was not standardized, or that sort of thing. It looked like in the future evolution, there's a need to start covering things that were beyond the standard. We were covering right now. I, I think the current effort is to just move the standard forward faster, not, not try and provide. I, 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 I don't think that there has to be a distinction here, essentially. Right? And, and I think we've got a lot of good ways to actually address this, especially with the, the increasingly rapid library um, uh, library releases that are, that are being planned. So I, 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 think, I, think, I think we're in very good shape for the next like, five to ten years. Michael? Um, right, so, so I did talk about the, uh, the, the, uh, the Microsoft meeting last week in my talk, and one of the first things Sean asked was, what about GPU support? And it turns out that what we had there from the last week was uh, did not have a great deal of GPU support, if any, if if, if any at all, um, from you know from the different proposals. The closest we could come to was something that was SIMD and a little bit of the um, a little bit of the async stuff, but there was nothing that takes us in beyond the the, uh, the other um, the other parts of the, the other part of the processors that, that that Sean just showed. Now, I wanted to also answer one of Dave's questions. Was, um, can this be all done in library now? So OpenMP has been working on accelerator support for three years now. And some of this is actually already out in, in uh, people's compilers, like NVIDIA is doing it and Cray is doing it. Um, the hard part, it, it turns out, is the memory model. Because that's where the, 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 the host talks to the, the, to the GPUs. The GPUs rarely ever talk, talk to each other. Um, they go to the local store, um, that EMA access, something like that. Um, so ultimately, this is uh, and this this is this is very interesting to me because I've, I've been trying to think of a way to, to bring this forward too in, in, in that way. And it turns out that Sean and I have similar ideas, mostly Sean and I to motivate all of this stuff. So maybe sometimes in the future we should take a look at some of these other ones in terms of um, um, AMP potentially. But but you know Microsoft is saying they're, they're, they're not. It is beautiful in my opinion, but it's um, they're not ready to standardize it unless it's um, it's had user experience. And this is probably the biggest problem with, um, with moving us forward is wh which one of these technologies has significant user ex experience, right? I mean, OpenMP's accelerator model is out there now, but it's really only started in January of this year with, this, with the development of this new group called OpenACC, which you might have heard of. Yeah. And that's only like three months of experience of, of, of users using this, using this stuff out there on actual GPUs. So that's just saying correctly, OpenMP is language and oh, sorry, more like, more like, more like, more like, more like. And OpenMP is both uh, it's, yeah, it's both core and library extensions, state of library. But yeah, most of the languages is through the Pragma and through the core language. Yeah. So the thing that, that concerns me the most is that I think. one of the biggest challenges in, in getting stuff really parallelized and getting the compiler to help parallelization in, in parallelizing your code is to convey your data dependencies to the compiler. 
because it's not about communication, it's not about spreading, it's, it's, it's all about data dependencies. Because when you can, when you are able to, to convey your data dependencies to the compiler, the compiler can do wonders. What the compiler can't do is go back and look at the code and say, hey, what has this guy thinking about and, and what data dependencies are implicitly in there? And that's why compilers have so much trouble with autoparalyzation and vectorization and all this stuff, because it's so difficult to react uh, just kind of retrospectively, figure out what was the intent in, in the original algorithm. If we find a way to, to bring that information to the compiler, just here's my execution tree, here's my dependency between data items, then the compiler can do whatever you want because it's absolutely clear what part of the algorithm can be parallelized, can be outsourced to the GPU, and at what points you have to synchronize in order to get the result. Because sometimes you have to synchronize, and that's the point where I disagree. It's not new cases, I think. It's, <coughs> it's, it's a coarse grained parallelism, which is, is killing us in, in, in the world and all that. So the key is data. And I think we have a couple of tools which allow us to convey the data dependencies to the compiler and the proto, because that's your expression. You have the way, a way to, to deal with the expressions you're writing, but it's much too much, uh, much too large effort to do so. And compile times blow up, and it, it's terribly hard to understand how to work with proto if you if you if you need it and so on. So, then I think we need language support, some, which helps us do this, this kind of stuff. Which uh, I mean, think Lisp, right? Lisp is so great because data and program and everything is one thing, and, and you don't have to, to to do something to to teach Lisp that this is a data structure. And hey, hey, that's my problem. Just do something with it. And that's missing in C++. And that's why there's a barrier between what we program today and what the compiler can do with it. Um, and then we need some language extensions. And if we, if we will be able to, to crack that up, then we won't have any problems to make a uh, compiler on this program properly without having to put too much brain into it. And you know, my hope is this, but this is, doesn't become just something that the uh, uh, folks working on concurrency are concerned with. But, but it permeates everything. So people, you know, even if you're looking at the standard library, if you're looking at source, well, what were the requirements on the type speed you passed into source if I wanted to do a parallel sort? And, uh, uh, you know, why can't STD source just already execute in parallel? I can start, start to kind of shape things and get people thinking along those lines. How do I get the parallelism out of the piece that I'm working on? What I do in apartments is that, and I agree, that, that the support for metaprogramming is really, is really, really going to be key because, because we need ways to, to interact with program. We need to be able to say, here's a piece of program, now I'm going to figure out how to, how to communicate that to a GPU. And if the information about data dependencies or you know the full expression isn't there for you to work with, it's going to be really, really hard. And so that, that goes beyond, you know, sort of just kind of make this algorithm parallel. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I just wanted to clarify, uh, the SG1 meeting did have discussion of data parallelism specifically targeting GPUs. Um, there were there, there was one fairly lengthy proposal and a lot of discussion after it, and it was focused on exactly what Hart described, um, a, a mechanism for conveying uh, the, the data dependencies of the program. Um, the, the Intel silk people were presenting it, and, and they, it's a technique for actually telling the compiler, these, these are my data dependencies, you can explode these on the GPU, and they have very good results go along with it, it, it works. Um, there, there were. I haven't seen silk running on the GPU. <laughs> they do have silk vectorization on the GPU, and it's, and it's very, very impressive in terms of the width which it can right? It can go to any type of GPU you want. Um, and the other interesting thing.
thing was we were the, the, there were people there from NVIDIA who worked on CUDA who work on similar technologies. And they were they were saying like yes, like this 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 is there is a good abstraction for the data dependency model. And interestingly, they didn't think that it needed that much better programming. They, they seemed to think that it was trackable in a library today. Um, and I don't know if they're right. We don't we don't have a proposal that actually tries to use the library that's compelling. Um, but I believe that there's someone from SG1 that's actually going to try and take the Silk data parallels model as a language feature and recast it as a library feature. And it'd be interesting to see whether they need more meta programming um, to make that library feature functional, right, useful, or whether it's whether we actually have enough. Yeah. You know, the problem, the problem with meta programming today is that is that it subjects the the a lot of the abstraction we have to the user, right? Yes. There's a lot of things that, that, that the user needs to know they're dealing with a special metaprogramming library. It's like if you use Phoenix, for example, or you know, use Lambda, or something like that. Please keep in mind all these, these special like this is a different kind of kind of environment. And, and I agree. His, his current plan is actually to use Lambdas properly rather than um, most of the other metaprogramming. And, and, and those are awkward too. They, they have their own awkwardness, but uh, there, there's, there's some evidence that actually Lambda would be able to express the data dependency model that's needed for um, this type of vectorization. I, yeah, I, you know, what I'm worried about is that it's not this type of vectorization. Right? Okay, you guys can go offline. <laughs> <laughs> One comment to that. I'm not opposed to SOAP, and, and that might be fine. I think that in the future, well, how many of you have done multi-threaded programming? More, with more than 10 threads, with more than 100 threads, with more than 1,000 threads, with more than 10,000 threads. Right, you see that the hands go down. And the problem is that it's so hard to do with what we have today. Um, and what I envision is a way of taking a zero algorithm, sort, whatever, and let the then compiler figure out how to bring it on the hardware. And for that, you have to convey the dependencies of the data directly without having to annotate it with SOAP or with whatever. Yeah. I, and, and, okay, it's, it's, a, it's a dream, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can go a fairly lengthy way to that goal because the algorithms already have all the information in there, implicitly. Everything's in there, and it will be right. Yeah. And all what it takes is just to do some figuring out what, what the hell can I do in the hardware. I agree that you know, automatic is great, but uh, right now I would be perfectly fine with very explicit.
I'm, I don't mean any threats. I mean computers. I see that as a future because what's happening is my ability to go to Amazon and start up 100,000 computers to work with any threats to work on my, my problem brings in new problems that we don't even think we can solve today. And, and I think that's the future uh, to, think, to think about as well. And so beyond a <coughs> single machine, a real distribution, if, if not uh, in, uh, in one farm, even worldwide. And, and and, and, and that, again, that brings in the ability to do things that we can't even imagine right now. So, um, that, that's, <coughs> really yeah, that's a very good point. That distribution and parallel, parallel is today. a lot in common. Yeah. Although I think distribution generally lends itself more to a library solution. Right? Because it's like if I can fully utilize the machine, mm -hmm. then I can have a library that can scan things out to utilize the rest of the machine. The problem that I have right now is I can't fully utilize the machine. But if you if you go to talk about abstraction, the abstractions are similar. Yes. So if you I want agree to work in an abstract level, you think this is the way to so go Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the problems or obstacles in our thinking being simple for programmers is that well, suppose we need to sort something. Uh, your question is how to panelize that sort or how to let the compiler do it. Then what? We have data sorted, and we are back to one thread. It's not the way to parallelize things. Right. Uh, I think that's the core in what Hartman said, that we need to be able to describe how the data will flow. And we are not going to have the data sorted and use it in one thread after that. So it's the imperative thinking that's very good. Comment up here? Uh, yeah, just a comment. Uh, to me, and where my software runs on normal people's machines, actually parallelization is still a very much a runtime problem, not just something the compiler can fix and we're done. Uh, when my mom, who has an old computer, it's still just a single core, and maybe right now it's pegged, uh, that I launch 16 threads, I might just be running slower than if I had been just running a single core. You would. Yes, well, that's. Uh, Still going problems. I may run. A, I may write amazing code that if I have, I can run on my dedicated super machine that I have under my desk at work runs beautifully. But I slow down my my customers. Yeah, and and we, I mean, certainly have to deal with that. I mean, it's uh, when I'm running on an iPad one, I've got a single core, and and still have a GPU there, but I have a single core on the CPU um, and one virtualization. Uh, so, but you know, I think any solution should scale up, right? Right. And so much of the server question, you know, servers tend not to have GPUs. Some do, but not all. Um, but they do have have factorization units in them. And ideally, your solution would scale to both. But there's not. So I point is just that you can't solve that. You might not be able to solve that problem completely at compiler. There, there might be some runtime analysis of what is oh. available to me right now. How much? How many cores of those? How many of those sixteen oh, yeah, cores no, no, are pegged no, no. right now that I can't use anyway? Compile time feeds the data that you need to the runtime. So, getting back to what Bartos said, it really is the mission of the community to standardize existing practice. So, the community. Process should be reactive. That's that's at least how it sees itself, and uh, and so that's so we need to be looking for solutions to these kinds of problems outside the community. We have a study group coming from you know, people that suffer many of the people.
even as it is, I don't mean I don't mean to stick on that as the as the likely figures of this problem at all. I just mean I just mean like right now they pick up something else because you know it it gives them the tools they need to express what they're trying to say. These these problems are being solved in other languages. Yes, that's good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So if you provide uh, a framework that is simple enough, provides a specific, uh, I don't know, uh, as tools in order to build on top of it, okay, it's fine. Mm. But here we are just in the middle. This is, this is too complex to master everything, but yet not too complex to cover all the data. And you know that here we're talking about uh, different kind of usage of the language. But there is no one wrong way right now that covers everything. For example, in number crunching, a lot of people are using uh, the parallel format because um, for a long time they've been in this uh, industry that allows to make parallel, and now it's covered in it. So it's, it's kind of hard. I mean, uh, we're going to have to make a clear cut, but simplicity is a good starting point. Yeah, <clears throat> getting back to the beginning of your presentation, when you were talking about number of pages in the, the spec and the size of standard pair, yeah. and, and talking about beauty and simplicity, how would you get there? What do you want to cut out? Or so, so that's a challenge. Uh, you know, it is uh, uh, one of the things that may or may not have helped. Uh, was concepts in trying to simplify, simplify the, 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 the way some of these things are expressed. Um, uh, my personal opinion is we kind of need to bite the bullet and go to just full, full compile time introspection and let us, let, let us write type functions like you would write a regular function. Uh, yeah. And I think the constant expression stuff gets us somewhat close to there and I actually have some ideas on uh, how we could go further with that. Uh, or even publishing a book in the appendix of elements of programming, but I'll challenge you to find them. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so so I, I think that, that would would be would be one way. Uh, that would actually let me take uh, something like a pair and write a transform function to transform the class pair into a to start up on Euclidean vector, right? Um, uh, so, so, so I, I, I think there are, are some ways down that line. Whether or not they pan out, I don't know. Uh, right now, what I try to do is write my C++ code, C++ code somewhat as simple as possible, which means a lot of times I will sacrifice efficiency for just simplicity and clarity. And I'm still struggling with you know, but is there a beautiful subset there? I'm still struggling with, in my own code, what the subset is that I like. Okay. I just make one comment that's a bit orthogonal, but because this, this discussion is properly where it should be. But I just point out that to those of us who are application developers, to really challenge us to think differently about how we design with domain knowledge in mind to think more parallelly than we ever have before on an application level. And I just say that I've enjoyed learning more of functional programming, whether it's been a Haskell airline, which I think is a beautiful language, not because I intend to work in those, but to bring those concepts of design back to C++. Yeah, and I think some of that is starting to get pulled through to C++. We're really glad for this. Yes.
after the modern There are some, some other editing companions, and some of them might make some very nice libraries. So sometimes I think we get a little, uh, myself included, uh, we have blinders on into, into STL, uh, which is a beautiful library and a beautiful way of doing things. Uh, but there are other ways. Uh, we need to be a little more of a different paradigm in the standard. Like, well, uh, okay, so um, so I, you know, so I with IBM, and I'm probably as far away from the consumer market as you can believe. We work with you know 120,000 cores and things like that. And one of the, the big things, and it's not just P GPU. And I'm trying to say that even in the world of uh, major weather services, they use C++ as a driver program, and the core is actually written in some, and the core computation is actually written in something else. The people <coughs> love G plus, love love G plus C++, but it's it's still a driver program for displaying the graphics, the GUI, the, the wonderful thermal lines and things like that. That's not what a calculation is done. Having said that, I don't know if GP, GP will be a flash in the pan. I don't know if it will be, maybe it won't. But let's just put it this way. The only question we want we probably want to ask is um, um, by C++ 17, will we want to be there without some support for these kinds of advanced, these kinds of advanced hardware? We want to put that in mind, and that's what we're, we're going to be at. Like I said, I don't know if GP, GP you will be class in the pan, but I do know that their data parallelism is not going away. Right, right, right. and that's going to be in my core. And, and I enjoyed talking with Michael the other day at lunch. Uh, I thought it was amazing to become, you know, I'm working on these little teeny devices, and he's working on massive clusters uh, uh, with, with thousands of CPUs. And we've got the same problems. The latencies are different. What's that? The latencies are different. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Um. Well, one last thing. I'll make a pitch for the gems session that's coming up where I'm going to show you some beautiful code. Oh. That would be good. That would be good. Yeah, I have some nice code to watch too. So, so this was, like I said, I, I, I explicitly picked this talk to be a little negative. And to raise issues. And it's not because I don't like some of those I think there's some amazing work, beautiful work, and for a period there, I wasn't paying any attention to it. And, and lately, I've been looking at it again, and it came out much nicer than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, that's off to the committee there. I think it is a good piece of work. Um, but coming in on the last day, uh, uh, or the last keynote, I, I wanted to raise the question and, and look at the places where I think it is failing and, and uh, I'll push it in a little bit different direction. I could have done the, it's all great, uh, uh, talk. I have those. <laughs> it is good. Uh, uh, but this is a little bit of a time. So, you're running this application a lot of it's in the what, what distinguishes the parts that are in C++? Uh, what distinguishes the parts that are in C++? Mostly, C++ becomes, you know, Lua binds well with C++, and then C++ binds well to the other systems on your library. So if we need to get a button up, well, that's Lua into Objective-C++ to get our button up. And, uh, if we need to be, uh, 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 a good part for the image processing pipe there. That's C++, but the C++ is only talking to intrinsics to the vectorization unit. Uh, uh, and then that gets hooked up through C++ to talk to the GPU. So if you, so, you can make a Lua talk to the vectorization unit directly, would you buy that C++? Uh, probably not, because I don't think I would get that kind of performance out of Lua. Um, well, I mean, so you mean that you're going back and forth with the vectorization unit over and over again? Yeah, I mean I got a chunk of code that's like living in the vectorization unit, living in the caches. Well, I mean, if you, once you've got that, if it's in the vectorization unit, then you, then you just talk to that directly and do it, right? Talk to that that's what I do right now, is I just say, call that chunk, go do it, go run my pipe. Are you saying that chunk is in C++? Uh, uh, no, I've got my 
Lua code that says culture to C++ to signal on the pipe. Right? So C++ is really just, well, it's just Lua. Yeah, C++, uh, as far as kind of scan, C++ goes, yeah, C++ is just Lua. That's, that's pretty sad. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you have to, 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 you have